If you are here, it means that you've been diagnosed with some sort of overgrowth in your GI tract, whether that be SIBO, CFO, Candida infection, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, E. coli, Citrobacter, you name it, you're looking for a way to nuke the darn thing. In this video, I'm going to be talking about the four worst antimicrobials for the GI tract. So if you want to get rid of whatever you've got, stay tuned to find out what these four are. All right, so let's get right into it. The first thing to cover, though, is that there are three different categories that would have landed an antimicrobial on my list. So A, is it ineffective? Does it just not work? You take this in hopes that it eradicates your SIBO and it just doesn't eradicate the SIBO. You take this in hopes that it eradicates the Klebsiella or the E. coli and it simply does not work. That's honestly probably what led you to this video. That's the one that most people are concerned about. Number two is that there's just better options available. It might not be an ineffective plant, but there are better options that we need to be relying on rather than using this particular plant. One of these fits into that category in particular. And then last but not least, the last category is, is it dangerous? Could it be overtly harmful to our health? And it's important to pause here and just note, these are antimicrobials and natural though they may be, they still carry risk. This is why I've been saying for years now that antimicrobials need to be maybe 10% of your SIBO strategy or your candida strategy or your dysbiosis strategy. 90% of the work needs to come from other stuff and building up the rest of your microbiome in part because these antimicrobials do carry some risk. Now, does that mean that oregano is just as bad as doxycycline? Absolutely not. But does it give us permission to overuse and abuse things like oregano and berberine and golden seal? I think absolutely not. So just keep that in mind. All antimicrobials will carry some degree of risk if they are overused and abused. And if the dose is inappropriate as it often is in the SIBO world, but I'm talking about for this category, something that I think is more overtly harmful to human health. So without further ado, let's get into the first herb. Now, the first one is probably gonna surprise a lot of you because this is a very popular antimicrobial, particularly in the SIBO space. And it's not on my list because it's ineffective. Golden seal is definitely effective for GI conditions. But as my friend Thomas Easley said in his book, he put this and said, Golden seal is over harvested and other herbs should be used as substitutes when possible. Coptis root, organ grape, and barberry all contain the alkaloid berberine and have similar antimicrobial properties as golden seal. So you guessed it, this is the herb that I was alluding to just a little while ago. This is the herb that makes the list, not because it's ineffective, but because there are much better options. And with golden seal being either endangered, threatened, vulnerable, or of special concern in 12 out of the 26 states that it grows in, we really need to protect this plant and we need to not use it. The way that I do use golden seal pretty frequently is sinus infections because it does have a tonifying effect on the, the mucosal tissue particularly in the ear, nose, throat, sinus region. So I use this as a low dose antimicrobial for sinus infections. I don't use it in the GI tract. If the first one surprised the SIBO people, this one is definitely going to surprise the people who have gotten stool testing that has a antimicrobial analysis report on it. So these are gonna be stool tests from Doctors Data, Genova Diagnostics. They basically take the bacteria that they grew from your poo, they put on a Petri dish and then they apply a little bit of berberine, a little bit of uva ursi, a little bit of whatever else, and they look to see if the bacteria is susceptible to that thing. But I'm here to tell you, this thing does not work in the GI tract whatsoever. Uva ursi is a wonderful herb, but it is not a GI tract herb. So if I may, I'm gonna read just a little paragraph from Medicinal Herbalism by David Hoffman, and he states, Bearberry, uva ursi, has a specific antiseptic and astringent effect on the membranes of the urinary system. It generally soothes, tones, and strengthens these tissues. It is specifically used for conditions in which there is gravel or ulceration in the kidney or bladder. It may be applied in the treatment of acute urinary tract infections, pilitis, and cystitis, or used as part of a holistic approach to chronic kidney problems. You didn't hear stomach, colon, small bowel, GI tract, nothing in that because that's not what this herb does. I don't for the life of me understand why Doctors Data and Genova and other companies put this in their report because even theoretically, if the Petri dish version of this is susceptible to uva ursi on a Petri dish, 
That doesn't mean that's what the herb is going to do when it gets in your GI tract. And I'm here to tell you, I've seen people who have tried this for GI dysbiosis and 99% of the time it does not work. This one's really gonna surprise the SIBO community because the Candybactin AR and BR products are some of the more popular antimicrobials for SIBO. Now, I know we all know that one research article, right? The 2014 study where they compared rifaximin versus the Candybactins versus the two biotics research products, and they showed that it was equally effective, both herbal products were equally effective in eradicating SIBO when compared to rifaximin. We've all read that study. And that is the reason why I've tried to use the Candybactin products on more than a few occasions. But I'm here to tell you, I just think that they're plain old ineffective. I haven't fully wrapped my head around why my clinical experience and other people's clinical experience is so different than what we were led to believe in the research article. But if you would come with me on a, a little journey, if you would indulge me, oh, folks of the internet, let me get my wardrobe on, hold on. Okay, tinfoil hat on, let's, let's conspire. So the company that owns Metagenics was bought, or rather Metagenics was bought in 2010 by the company that owns Amway. Now I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. Companies acquire companies all the time. And I'm not saying that Amway is a bad company or anything like that. But we've all seen this before. When a big company purchases a smaller company and acquires their products, oftentimes they will tweak and reformulate those products a bit in order to cut costs or perhaps if they think they can make the product better somehow. But usually it's a cost savings thing. So I think that it's not out of the question to think that when Metagenics was purchased by Amway, maybe they started to change some of the Metagenics formulas over the years that they have owned that company. Now, Metagenics has since been sold to a different company. I believe it's called Griffin. But my point is, I think that perhaps what happened is that the Candybactin products might have been better and then when they did that research study that came out in 2014, they were probably treating those patients sometime in 2012 or 2013. And then it took them a little while to write the article and get it published. But they maybe were using some of the older inventory from the Metagenics products as they once were, that presumably with my tinfoil hat theory, maybe they were more effective with the older formulation. And then as the company ownership changed, they reformulated and as they got rid of the older inventory, now we're dealing with a different formulation that's on the market today compared to what is available in research studies. We've seen this before, right? There was a lot of concern a few years ago when Nestle purchased pure encapsulations. Knock on wood, I have not seen any of the formulas really change their efficacy at this point, so that's great. Uh, similarly, years ago, Bayer purchased the company that makes Iberogast. And there are a lot of people out there that say Iberogast was a much more effective prokinetic prior to Bayer purchasing the company. So for all that this seems like a tinfoil hat theory, and I know it sounds a little bit zany, that's the only theory I have. Because it doesn't make sense to me why that research article makes these seem like really great products. And my clinical experience and other clinicians' clinical experience has been kind of how convenient that I'm holding something that's the color of silver because silver is the last one on the list. So this would be stuff like colloidal silver or other silver supplements. This is more of a theoretical concern than anything else, but I really wonder if this one is overtly dangerous. Why on God's earth one would willingly ingest silver is beyond me. I don't say that to sound like a meanie pie. I'm just saying it doesn't strike me as something that we should be ingesting. I know it has known antimicrobial properties and it can be used topically for that purpose. But in my mind, this is not something that we should be ingesting, certainly not on a regular basis. So silver makes the list mostly because of theoretical concerns regarding its safety. Not that it's not an effective antimicrobial. I just really don't think human beings should be ingesting silver. So that rounds out the list of the four worst antimicrobials for SIBO and gut dysbiosis, in my opinion. But now I want to hear your opinion. Did you try some of these and did they work? Are you one of the few who tried Uva Ursi for a GI-based infection and it actually made you feel better and it worked for you? Are you somebody who has tried Golden Seal and the tincture of death that naturopaths like to hand out? Do you think that the Candybactins are actually great products that I'm just off my rocker? 
I know that some people are going to have found these effective, but just when you're searching the internet and you're looking for answers and you're trying to gamble on a supplement or an herb and choose the thing that has the highest probability of helping you, I hope that this list helps you narrow down the four things that you shouldn't waste your money on because at the bare minimum, they have a very low likelihood of actually helping you beat the dysbiosis or the SIBO that you were trying to conquer. So share your experience down in the comments below. Thank you so much. And I will see you in the next video. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much and I'll see you in the next video.